My name is Roger Hicks and this is my second video blog which I've given a lot of thought to and, uh, and thus need to read from a prepared text. Uh, I'll just zoom in a bit. There we go. Scroll up a bit. This is not a defence of what Brady did which is indefensible, but of what I think motivated him, which was his sense of betrayal by his own and other European governments of their native peoples to the madness of mass third world immigration and the melting pot, or the ideology rather, of the melting pot of a multiracial and multicultural society, or multiculturalism as he calls it, which suppresses as racist the natural ethnic basis of national identity and is destroying, as presumably intended to do, native Europeans' distinctive racial, cultural, historical and even prehistorical identity as a community of closely related peoples. I don't share or understand Breivik's political views or ideology, the threat he sees in cultural Marxism and Islam which is his, I believe, misconceived way of accounting for this betrayal. And I abhor his use of extreme violence, or any violence for that matter, against the innocent. But I do share his sense of betrayal, having seen my own country, Britain, transformed beyond recognition during my own lifetime by mass third world immigration and state ideology of multiracialism and multiculturalism. In many parts of our cities, native white Britons are already a minority and it is predicted that indigenous Britons will become an ethnic minority in the country as a whole within just two more generations. It is a tragedy that Breivik felt compelled by this betrayal to commit such a horrendous act of violence. I will leave it to future generations with the benefit of hindsight to judge him. Certainly, European governments' deafness to or dismissal as racist of their indigenous people's concerns about mass third world immigration, multiracialism and multiculturalism must bear much of the blame for driving him to such an extreme and terrible act. But I'm not interested in allocating blame, so much as exposing the reality of this betrayal, awareness and acknowledgement of which has been suppressed for far too long, and in understanding it before it provokes yet more violence and leads ultimately to civil war, as native Europeans increasingly recognise what is happening and rise up in defence of their continent and their ancestral homelands. The sooner we face up to it, the better our prospects of negotiating rational and civilised solutions and avoiding further and much greater violence. How can a democratically elected government possibly betray their own peoples, one asks, because it hardly seems credible. That would be an act of self-betrayal, which is what, in fact, it is, I think, and makes it so difficult to recognise. The answer to this question of those in positions of authority, of course, who are largely responsible for this betrayal, is that there has been no betrayal, and that those who think otherwise, like myself, are just nasty xenophobes and racists, or evil madmen like Breivik, which doesn't leave a lot of room, in fact no room at all, for rational argument or civilised debate. Just as in medieval times, anyone objecting to church, i.e. state ideology, was simply dismissed as a heretic, now we are dismissed as bigots and racists or madmen. And it is this dismissal and condemnation of our concerns more than anything else, I suggest, that drove Breivik to his desperate and terrible deed as the only way he could see of drawing public attention, otherwise dominated by state ideology and indoctrination, to his cause.
It is a form of collective self-betrayal and thus very difficult to recognize and face up to, especially by those involved in it, many of whom see it as a moral virtue or imperative. It is perpetrated by those in positions of trust and authority with the complicity of society at large, which has been intimidated and brainwashed into believing the ideology behind it. There are some similarities to, to the betrayal recently exposed in the Catholic Church, some of whose priests were able to get away for decades with sexually abusing children in their charge, because protected by the Church itself. Nobody, least of all Catholics, wanted to believe that it could be true. Thus the long delay, criminally extended by the Church itself, in facing up to it. But it was true. Their children had been betrayed and abused by the very institution in which they had placed such complete trust. In a similar fashion, only on a far grander and wider scale, the state has betrayed us, its native peoples, who put our trust in it, believing it to represent our nation with our best interests at heart. Facing up to this betrayal is difficult and painful just as it was for Catholics to face up to their betrayal by the church they believed in and identified with. And of course many Catholics still refuse to face up to it, or are, or are unable to face up to it, emotionally perhaps. Putting all the blame, as the church would have them do, on the rogue paedophile priests. Now it is the state and its defenders who would put all the blame for what he did on Anders Breivik himself while they and their ideology remain blameless. Britain and Western Europe are already natively and unsustainably overpopulated, so the last thing that we needed was mass immigration from other continents. Yet that is what we have had imposed on us, have imposed on ourselves, in part for economic reasons, the demand for cheap foreign labour, but more importantly, I think, for ideological and power political reasons of state. In overreaction to the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust, as well as to the inhumanity of Jim Crow and apartheid, Western democracies embraced an ideology which was the exact but equally extreme opposite of Nazi racial ideology. It's an ideology which denies, demonizes and suppresses as racist the natural ethnic basis of national identity, in which race and ethnic origins are considered to be of no social or political importance except to evil racists, like the Nazis of course. This despite the obvious importance, at least to the ideologically unblinkered, of race and ethnic origins for any deep and meaningful sense of both personal and group, i.e. national, identity. As an initial response to the horrors of Nazism, it was understandable. But instead of being allowed to moderate and accommodate itself to the reality of race, along with its social and political importance, it was consolidated in its extreme form by those seeking to exploit, to exploit it as a source of spurious moral authority and power political advantage. The noble causes of anti-fascism and anti-racism were hijacked like other noble causes before them, something I will come back to in subsequent blogs, and transformed into what now amounts to anti-white reverse racism by means of which whites, that is, ethnic Europeans, force other whites to deny and despise their own ethnic identity as Europeans, in favour of an inclusive, globalised, post-racial, effectively post-European, state identity. British, French, American, or whatever. It is not an interracial issue, as the state which won't which wants to dismiss 
those who raise it as racist would have us believe, but an issue of white versus white power politics, and can be summed up in the following adaptation of a well-known proverb. In the lands of ideological colorblindness, as all Western democracies now are, the colorblind, or those who can feign it, are kings. This, I suggest, is the underlying cause of our collective and ongoing self-betrayal. Everyone who wants to pursue a career in politics, the media, academia, etc., has no choice but to, but to embrace state ideology. Just as in medieval times, everyone, whatever their station in society, had to embrace church ideology. I believe that my own analysis and understanding of this betrayal, although in need of further development, to be, is far more realistic than Breivik's, in contrast to whom I also believe that a peaceful, non-violent, friendly, non-accusatory approach will be more fruitful than his approach, which, apart from all the suffering it causes, only alienates people and hardens divisions between the two sides i.e. between nationalists, like myself, who identify with their race, and statists, who don't, or don't dare, but identify with the state. Or, as the latter, i.e. statists, would have a see it, between racists and anti-racists. But now I think I've said enough for one block, which I hope will stimulate thought and civilised debate.